Well, welcome back to Trinity Radio. I'm Braxton Hunter, and along with me is Jonathan Pritchett. And today we're going to be talking about spiritual warfare. We're forgiven, we're shown mercy and grace, and our punishments probably aren't as harsh as they should be, even within this lifespan. Do skeptics bring objections to the case? Of course they do. What's going on with you today? <laughs> they just don't like it. They don't like it that God is just and he has every right as creator to do what he will. God is the best explanation for the beginning of the universe. Of now y'all having to look at our faces, which for that I apologize. All right, we are glad to be back. We took a week off while Dr. Braxton Hunter was globe trotting. You can watch a video on his globe trotting uh, on our YouTube channel. And first of all, welcome back and tell us a little bit about your trip. Thanks. Um, yeah, it was actually a long trip. Uh, you've actually been watching some episodes of Trinity Radio while I was already gone because we are professionals and we uh, record only missed things one. ahead of time and only missed one even though I was gone for like three or four weeks. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I um, if you'll watch the video, the topical video on this, I think it's called The Road to Northern Ireland, you'll see all that I did. But I went through the American South and the Irish North. So that's basically <laughs> what, what happened. But um, there was an incredible... Thing that ha maybe I should just start by telling this. It's in the video, but tell what happened to this uh, person at, at, the, at the. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Okay. Because we're going to be talking about spiritual, spiritual warfare, warfare, and I believe there was some going on. But basically, what happened was, and by the way, if I look, I get bags under my eyes. It's still jet lag. I mean, this is only two days after I got back or something. So, no. uh, but so went to Northern Ireland, and I'm an evangelist now. What we push here is a brand of evangelism that we call evangelistic apologetics. And I somebody somebody wrote a book. Somebody wrote a book on about that. It. But anyway, um, but so that's what I was doing. I was doing evangelism. Pseudo Braxtonius wrote a Pseudo book. Pseudo Braxtonius, yes. I, I did a uh, evangelism and apologetics event in Northern Ireland, and it was great. I, I really enjoyed it. Just in terms of getting to see the country, it was phenomenal, and it is everything that you think. You know, I, I thought that on television and movies that they boosted the color uh, <laughs> of the greens and all that. No, it's real. In fact, you don't know the half of it unless you've been there. You can't capture how beautiful it is. But uh, in terms of just seeing another country and going there and all that, it was it was wonderful. But uh, in terms of evangelism. For the first few days, it was really I was really upset because I'm used to I like seeing people come to know the Lord Jesus Christ for the first time and Amen. and you know it's not it's not because of me but usually when I go preach places there's there's some immediate fruit you know some immediate conversions yes like God that. uses his evangelists that he calls I don't know why I feel like I'm kind of having to apologize for that but I don't think I should. Yeah. But uh, um, I'll tell you why. Why? Epis topic for another episode, but all the dumb things about evangelistic methodology in predominantly evangelical and Southern Baptist circles. Yeah. That's why. That's it. And if they got saved right when you preached, it was clearly a false conversion. Right. right? That sort of <laughs> yeah. thing. Uh, but anyway, the thing about it is, so there was nothing. Uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Nothing. Yet there were, we knew there were lost people there. In fact, I'll tell you this about Northern Ireland. I've never seen this anywhere else I've ever been, except from a few older men that I've met here in the States. What was interesting, there was a large number of people who would tell you, because they're so religiously informed there. The Catholic, Protestant thing is so heated. There's a church on every block. It's like the American South. But to the extent that there are a lot of people there who will tell you, I'm lost, I need to get saved. Okay, would you, would, would you like to get saved? No, I'm having fun. I'll get saved one of these days, but it's not yeah. time. I, I'm, I'm, but I am lost, just so you know. And I understand the gospel. You know, It's amazing to have adult men, like men in their 50s, telling you this. Um, it's, it's interesting. But, but anyway, um, there, so there were lost people that self-identified as lost at each of these you know, services. So Wednesday, so Wednesday, I went up on top of Cave Hill which is this beautiful hill.
hill um, above Belfast. And uh, if movies are filmed there. TV shows are filmed there. It's, it's incredible. And I was there with a guy named Graham. And Graham is a guy I've been saved about three years at the church. And he's a deacon at the church. And uh, he's like 42 years old and he's close to my age and everything. And I think God sent Graham, honestly. Um, he, he, you know, he talked to me about it. He really encouraged me, made me feel better about the situation because it wasn't about my abilities. It's just I didn't understand why did God bring me to Northern Ireland if nothing's going to happen. And it looked like nothing was going to happen. So that night was Q&A night, question and answer. And um, the question and answer night, you know, we weren't going to have an altar call. We hadn't done any altar calls. You know, we weren't going to do an altar call. There wasn't going to be any obvious, you know, uh, appeal to the now, gospel, you know. But this was the first time in how long that you actually weren't giving altar calls? Yeah, I, I typically give altar calls. Right. So, and I and I think that, that this shows that they are helpful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, but the thing is, so, so on Q&A night, there's obviously not going to be an altar call, and there's not going to be uh, really an obvious appeal to the gospel. Now, I would have made that appeal, but as it worked out, I answered all the questions. I answered the questions about homosexuality, about the problem of evil, about... Uh, why do we trust the Bible? Uh, why is uh, why do we why do we Christians seem to think that he that Jesus is the only way? Why can't Muslims and all, why all these religions should be valid and all this? I answered all those questions, and uh, but here's the thing: at the end, and it's not the pastor's fault. It's just what we did. You know, it's what we plan to do. He he got up after the last question was asked, and he said, "Okay, that's enough, folks. We're gonna." Go ahead and cut it off there, but um, we ask you to uh, come back tomorrow night. You know, that sort of thing. Close down the service. No, like, hey, if you're here tonight and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, tonight is your night. You need to be saved, blah, blah, blah. Nothing like right. that. Well, before this thing had begun, the Q&A night, I was obviously very crestfallen about the way this had been going so far. And I prayed in a back room, sitting on a pew, that God would let a light bulb go on for some skeptic there that night. And that they would get, you know, like a gift of faith almost. You know, that'd be a whole discussion for another topic too. But yeah, the, uh, oddly enough, people who aren't Calvinists actually believe that faith is right, a gift. You know? Right. And so I prayed those two things. Well, after the thing is over, I'm answering some other questions one on one. You know, just with, as people are leaving, and someone says, "There's a girl that needs to talk to you. She's in the back room." So I go back there with another lady that's that's there too, and we go back there. And it's this beautiful, red-headed, fair-skinned, 30-year-old Irish girl, um, obviously, Northern Irish. And so I sit down there, and I'm talking with her. This is Amy, and Amy's telling me about how she has been a Catholic and an atheist for years. But tonight, as she was listening to the Q&A, she says, it's like a light bulb was turned right. on. Exactly what I'd prayed. It's like a gift of faith or something, is what she says. And I tell her, I'm like, Amy, you, you have no idea. This whole week I've been wondering, why am I in Northern Ireland? I said, this guy Graham, I was telling him today, I don't know why I'm here, I don't know what's going on, no, nothing's happening. And uh, they called the event Just One, the Just One event. And that's because there's just one way to salvation. But I told her, I said, you're the reason, Amy, you're the reason that God brought me to Northern Ireland. You may be the Just One that gets saved. She prayed her own prayer of repentance, it was beautiful, and uh, all that. But, but what was great was, she told people about this, and another person uh, who was significant to this congregation, I don't want to say who because it's not my place, I don't think, to tell you who, but there was a person who, that's my computer, don't freak out. Um, but the, um, the bottom line was that this other person became a Christian too after having not uh, given in for a long time. And then there were a few other people that were saved throughout the week after that. So I think there was some fierce spiritual warfare, but I think ultimately um, God blessed and it, God's power was very evident in Northern Ireland. But I can tell you this, I, I don't want to overstate it, but you know, Northern Ireland has been a place that religiously, politically, and militarily has gone through very difficult times for decades now. Right. And, uh, and so I'd say it's a hotbed for spiritual warfare. I think they yeah, because you had mentioned not only are you having <clears throat> kind of an existential issue of just why are you here, you know, midweek or whatever, but you you had mentioned to me uh, that even when you stepped out of the plane, you you could just sense. The, I didn't have like a like a. 
I will say this, and some of our cessationist friends out there, I don't see why. It's just those are the kind of people that normally would would have issues with this. Some people will feel as though to say that you could sense something dark or whatever yeah. in a place is, uh, is uh, some people would say that's, sorry, someone just stepped in the room, but some people would, would say that that's kind of being mystical about it in a bad way and all that. I have been in places where I have felt that way. I have too. A lot of people say they feel that way in New Orleans. I didn't feel that way in New Orleans and it bothered me. I was like, is there something wrong with me? <laughs> <All right. laughs> but, but I did feel that way in a place in Tennessee where I've gone a few times. Yeah. Uh, I didn't feel that. Of evil, I, I didn't right? feel that in Northern Ireland. I, I didn't feel that. <laughs> Northern Irish people would be like, "Oh yeah, you felt it in the Republic of Ireland." That's what <laughs> no, no, I didn't feel it in Ireland at all. But I'll tell you this: I did feel. Uh, I, I did have a personal attack, I think, and I won't go into the details of it. I've shared it with you, but um, to put it simply, things that have happened in my past before uh, you know uh, I surrendered to preach or anything else, things from my teenage years. You know that I sinful things I did. The enemy was bringing it back in my face in a way that was clearly not God, because these are things that have been forgiven, repented of, right. can't be changed. You know they're in the past, buried at the bottom of the sea of forgetfulness, as far as the east is from the west. But in a way that has not happened in twenty years, the it was so on my mind that I could not sleep at night. And even when I was getting ready to preach certain nights of this meeting. I couldn't focus because I was so thinking about this, and I can, and when I came back to the states, gone. Yeah. And I'll frankly tell you, I think that a messenger of Satan was sent. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. That, that, that's the thing. Um, if now we could, I think in a subsequent episode we're going to get more into just demons in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's on our agenda. Just you know look out for that episode but i do think there's a sense in which if you're about to go preach or you're on a trip and let's say i'm with you if i can get in your ear and become a complete distraction for what you're there for Mm -hmm. or anybody else a local church member who's a tour guide or whatever that that um not that you have one like this but i'm just saying in general some sort of situation a person can do things to distract you why would a Christian ever doubt, and given our worldview, that non-physical beings could do the same thing? And, well, and get, I can get in your head. Why couldn't a demon get in your head? Not possession, right. but just in your ear or whatever, yeah, yeah. In, in whatever ways that they operate. Yeah. Uh, there's no reason to think that that doesn't happen, that that's not the case. But sometimes I think, uh, even in the West, at least, in certain cultures, maybe just... Uh, Predominantly white evangelicals, really, Mm because you don't find this with Latinos, and you don't find. I mean, they're like, yeah, (laughs) you know, (laughs) Um, and and others, but but, and maybe it's just because I've typically ran in cessationist crowds or whatever. But some reason we there there is a nervousness to act like Christian reality. Yeah, Christian reality is Christian reality. Yeah, Yeah, J.P. Moreland said about this when I was studying to teach class on angels and demons. I came across this quote from Moreland where he says. Uh, the belief in the demonic and the angelic are system dependent beliefs. If you believe Christianity is true, that goes along with it. Right. You can't deny it. Right. You can't act because you live in an age of scientism in a 21st century, you know, Western world that those things don't exist because you sound weird if you talk about them. No, they're real. Yeah, JP Morland. If Moreland, Christianity is real, JP Morland has also recounted stories where he's seen angels. So. Well, I didn't know that. I'll have to study. Well, that. yeah, but he did it one night. We were listening to him at Biola. He was doing a, a seminar thing, and he was talking about how um, he had seen angels, and then he had talked about how a lady had seen angels standing around him as well. So it's oh, I did hear about this. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, I mean, do do we embrace that side of the world? But how that ties into spiritual warfare is that their presence is real, and their activity against God's people is real. That's, Sorry, that's his ahead. line from uh, Usual Suspects, you know. the greatest. I, it probably is. I've seen yeah. that movie. But I've right. Heard. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing everyone he didn't exist. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Probably true. Yeah. But the Bible flatly says that spiritual warfare is real. Yeah. Paul in Ephesians 6, 12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against super and, uh, spiritual forces, forces of evil. I can't talk. 
there's demonic warfare going on right, right. now. <laughs> uh, uh, the dark world against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, or as that's in the heavenlies, right? Yeah. The heavenlies, by the but, way, but the is a term that just kind of means the spiritual. Yeah, and the darkness. Know. I mean, that's what goes back to our earlier conversation. Yeah. Yes, you can sense that darkness. The Bible calls the world, you know, this darkened world. And, of course, Christians being Christians, it's, it's in this darkened world that we are to shine like lights. Like stars in the sky, like it says in Philippians <clears throat> 2, when the church actually acts like the church. So there is a sense in which the world is a dark place. It can be detected by us who are in tune to things of the Spirit. We can sense that kind of thing. And I think that the enemy is out there, and the enemy... Uh, I think it's too reductionistic to say our only problem is our old sinful nature. I think that is. I think that undercuts the new nature... And it screens out every other possibility that the Bible gives us as a part of our reality. Mm -hmm. And so just chalking up all of our struggles to just, oh, well, the remnants of the old man still in our flesh or whatever, well, is undercutting the reality of the Bible. And so, Sometimes it's true. You know, there well, is, I'm not saying it's there, not true. There, I'm saying to, to, ch to reduce it all right, to Right, right, right. I agree. The charis there's, a, there's a book written by some charismatic uh, couple. It's a husband and wife. I can't remember the name of it, but it's famous. For this, yeah. because it lists out what the demon is for pneumonia, for coughing, oh, yeah. for acne, for everything. Like anything that happens to you, it's a demon, and it's ridiculous. Now, right? Uh, the, I think that looking at the ministry of Jesus is a good a good way of seeing the what's realistic here. Yeah. Sometimes Jesus just heals someone, right? Right. Sometimes he casts out demons, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think this is the case. Sometimes there is a demonic. Uh, effort going on, and sometimes stuff's just happening. Yeah, you're just saying. But both are true. Yeah, right? well, I think part of the... It's like in the Angels and Demons course, we assign a book called Sense and Nonsense, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think part of with spiritual warfare, if you want a good book on spiritual warfare, we recommend uh, Harold F. Hunter's book. That's a good, good book on it. Simple Strategies for Spiritual Warfare. This is a sensible book. But the problem is, like the books you're talking about, what makes us so turned off by the whole conversation of spiritual warfare, just the same with angels and demons, is all of the nonsensical gobbledygook out there. It's just mm -hmm. non. It's just ridiculous uh, stuff written, you know, usually popular level books from from goofy preachers who, you know, will end up telling you that a demon has possessed your transmission and that's why your car's right. failing. And right. and it's because of that, I think that we become apprehensive of talking about this. Now, one of the things that I noticed, and I was talking about this on my Facebook wall, and I'm happy to be anybody's Facebook friend, um, is I got curious because, to be honest, I've read this book, and I've read every book with the last name Hunter on it, except for this one. I, I promise before I die, I'll read your fiction book. When you do, you'll say, why didn't I read this sooner? <laughs> no, it's like... Also, there's a good bit about spiritual warfare in the second book. Okay, that's great, <laughs> but this one is actually about spiritual warfare. Yeah, so we're yeah, going to go back to yeah. plugging your dad's book, yeah. and and when I have time, when I get to the end of my life and read this before I die, I'll say, "Wow, it's so relaxing that I have nothing else to do but read but fiction." <laughs> read Braxton's. Everyone loves this book that loves to read fiction, but anyway, this book, <laughs> which you can get on Amazon. It's a good introduction to get... If Honestly, you, if you have to choose between the two, get Spiritual Warfare, Warfare by Harold Hunter. Right, infinitely more If you're going helpful. on a vacation, or as my Northern Ireland friends say, on holiday, yeah. and you need something to read as you sit by the pool, still get Spiritual Warfare by, <laughs> by Harold Hunter. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. No, my wife yeah. loves this book. Yeah, I know. But no, uh, seriously, if you want, like, for me, because I didn't know much about spiritual warfare, mm -hmm. coming into uh, coming up as a Christian, it had eaten you alive, and you just didn't a, know well, it. Well, I went from I went from yeah. Steve Lawson, cessationist, Calvinist uh, guy, uh, one of John MacArthur's proteges. Went from his church to a Southern Baptist church. Mm -hmm. Great Southern Baptist church still had a um, an overall cessationist type disposition. Southern Baptist, predominantly uh, Caucasian congregation, and spiritual warfare just didn't really come up a whole lot. So I. And, and I had some spiritual formation courses in college, of course, at Liberty and Computer Biola. again. Sorry about that. But I never really knew much about it. So the, reading this book was one of the f few books that I've actually read. Was it helpful? Uh, yeah, because you, you can go through and then you can make notes and you can answer questions and things like that. In Great. The book. Yeah, it's very, very helpful and it's not nonsense. And so getting books written by people who are smart, like your father, 
um, is a good way to get into this if you're curious about what spiritual warfare really is. Clinton Arnold's got a good book. Um, and I know other people... It is. It's more of an academic book right. about... What's, the nature of it—it's kind of like a systematic theological treatise of what it's of like. yeah. demonic stuff. But this is, and this this has some of that. But this is really more practical. Yeah. You know how to have assurance of your salvation when you're under attack. How to deal with with infirmities and illness. How, how to, um, you know, how to how to discover God's will when you're uh, in doubt about what God's will for your life is. Real issues that we face because that that stuff is actually spiritual warfare, and so. Uh, for me, getting something like this is a good way to get it if you don't know much about it. But anyway, I didn't know much about it, so I got nosy because Steve Selby is a Dr. Selby is a professor here who teaches our spiritual warfare class, and I got notifications that people had up uploaded assignments, and I found uh, myself reading all these assignments that I didn't even have to grade. So now I'm sure some students are mad because I wasn't reading the assignments I need to grade. But I was curious because this thing, this area fascinates me because I'm utterly lay when it comes to it. Well, here's the thing. So, you had just mentioned several things there. Uh, one thing is the physical. Even though we don't believe that every time you get pneumonia or a cold or acne, it's a demon trying to destroy your life. Um, I think there is biblical evidence that even in this age, if you like that terminology that we live in, this sort of thing can happen. I just referenced this passage just the other day in another one of these episodes, but 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, Paul says, To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassing great revelations, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. Okay, now most scholar, well, I don't know if I can say most scholars, this scholar takes that to be a physical infirmity of some sort or the other. Right. Would you agree? This scholar. The thorn in the flesh, this scholar me. Okay. Takes this to be a thorn in the flesh to be a physical infirmity. I was like, is there scholars sort of in the room? No, a thorn, <laughs> a thorn in the flesh. He was given a thorn in the flesh. Yeah. And then he specifies a messenger of Satan. Satan. Right. So uh, a demonic angel, a, de a demon, you know, uh, to torment me. Now, people debate about that, but I think, flat, I, you know, Clinton Arnold agrees. This is a physical infirmity brought on by demonic activity in his life. Right. Three times he pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. None less than the Apostle Paul asked for this to be taken away three times, and God didn't take it away. Right. Now, the, but the bottom line I wanted to get in there is uh, Paul himself experiences some sort of demonic attack. Um, attack in his life that resulted in a physical problem of some sort. Yeah. We don't know exactly what it is, but but he had some problem there. Uh, that that shows you that it can happen in, no matter how spiritual you are, no matter how holy you are. And here's an interesting thought that I don't know if you've ever considered this, but in the Old Testament the battles that they fought were no less demonically motivated. The enemy, you know, was demonically motivated. However, they were physical battles. The, 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 the warring with the evil one was physical. You know, you're, yeah. you're, Israel was fighting these other countries and all this sort of thing. But there was something supernatural. There was spiritual warfare yeah. motivating that physical warfare. Right. And that is the context, I think, in which with that history, Paul is pointing out um, that it's not like that anymore. That now it's spiritual. It's it's more often spiritual. Right. We're not going with a battle axe against the enemy anymore. Now it's spiritual, but it's still as fierce. It's right. still as Equally dangerous. As fierce. Yeah. yeah, I think so. And one of the things I noticed by reading those papers is women seem to have written, in that class anyway, better papers than the men had written. You're just trying to win points with the women no, in the crowd. No, I'm not because, you know, I mean, I'm I'm just it was just an observation. Because and, and here's why. And so I asked if any on my Facebook wall if anyone else had an explanation for this. It's not that the men's papers were bad. It's just that the way that women talked about it seemed like they were more straightforward. And the men's papers, part of the problem, I think, is men were trying to qualify every statement to try to make sure they didn't sound weird by talking about uh, inner struggles, to sound weird talking about possible demonic attacks and things like that from the enemy. Whereas the women were straightforward, and I was just wondering, and it got me thinking, how, women seem less apprehensive about talking about this subject of spiritual warfare, at least in the papers that I read. And I was wondering if there was some sort of explanation for that or if that was just a freak occurrence for this particular class. And the responses I got was from men and women, overwhelmingly, uh, some people wrote dumb comments. and I, Like that I'm smart. <laughs> no, Amy's... Amy, Amy Cooper said, 
Uh, you said, well, Braxton Hunter does seem to be a man who's in tune to this stuff. Yeah. And Amy Cooper said, well, that's because he's a smart man. Right. Well, no, I wasn't trying to say, I didn't say, here's what I've never said. All men don't get this as much as all women do. I, I, right. I never made that claim. And I was just saying, generally, on average... It, it seems like more women get this than men do. Or they're, they're more open to talk about it, and they understand... I'll tell you a theory. I'll and it you, seemed like everyone agreed with that that made... Yeah, I'll give you my theory. Comments. My theory is, see, because we're into apologetics yeah. and stuff, and we like to be very scientific with how we study the Bible and all this sort of thing. And not, not to say that we don't have a relational situation with... God and with the Lord Jesus Christ, but we, I mean, this is what we do for fun. We, we, we are, you know, academic yeah. with the Bible and with apologetics, you know, I have often been very excited about some evidence or something and telling my wife about it and her response. And I've gotten this from a lot of other women too. The response is just, well, yeah, I mean, it, it's true. You know, like, <laughs> like you should expect. And they have this faith that is seems impervious. You know, many of them, like like just they, they, they don't need the apologetics in their mind. They don't need it because, well, you, why don't you guys just believe in it? You know, what's the problem, <laughs> you know? Uh, maybe there'll be an uptick in presuppositional women apologists. I don't know. Yeah. But the thing about it is, I think that is kind of how they are. They're like... Thomas Linton would be happy. Yeah, it's that. real. So, of course, demons are real. So, of course, that might have been a demon. You know, I yeah. think that's what it is. I think whereas men, number one, we're more concerned about looking stupid. You know, we're more concerned about eye rolling going on. Yeah. And so as a result of that, we tend to take extra measures to make sure that no one thinks we're not brilliant and measured and all those sorts of things. Whereas women are just, I think, many times much more practical. Yeah. Like, no, it's real. And there's demons over there. Now, one of my fellow... Uh, Biolians, um, is that the term? I guess. Uh, he's my friend Thomas, and he had pointed out because his wife is in counseling and they see this. And I did go back after he made that comment and look up some numbers, um, and looked at some of the degree areas of these people in these spiritual warfare. And a lot of it they've taken counseling courses or, or something, but at Trinity, it is almost neck and neck the number of men and women that are in the counseling programs, okay. Whereas the gap is much wider, and in apologetics, it's huge. It's like we have 20 women <laughs> in our apologetics. Wow. Yeah, but but it was like neck and neck. I mean, it was like within like 30 people. But with the 20 women we got, that's all you They're need. awesome. That's right. <laughs> uh, but see, it's just, uh, and so that, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, losing my train of you thought You were going here. on with this female empowerment stuff. Right. Go on. <laughs> No, it was what my friend Thomas was talking about with... Um, I'm all for it, man. Yeah, with the women and, and, and seeing this in counseling. So even the men that wrote good papers, too, in this area, they were involved in counseling. And I think biblical counseling or Christian counseling, either one, they deal with this spiritual warfare stuff on a, you know, on a ground level. And the church pornography is a big issue with men in the church, right? So they come to you and they're struggling with pornography and the temptation of pornography. Uh, yeah, there's not a porn demon right necessarily that's I mean, my knowledge yeah. yeah could be yeah you know your your guy and his wife may be right i don't know but what we do know is that you do have a sinful nature that's still left over you know uh still dealing with struggling in the flesh mm -hmm. and so you get that but it seems like i think they can capitalize on your innate right. desires yeah that's what i was trying to get well, to i mean think about the serpent in the garden um he did not give eve desires he just pointed out something that played on her desires right. she was the one who mentioned that uh, it's pleasurable to eat or it's you know uh, pleasant to the eyes or the senses or whatever you know you see all the things there from first john chapter 2 the the uh, lust of the eyes lust of the flesh the pride sinful of pride of life and all that yeah so so he just he just the desires that were already there he you know capitalized on so you know i think that i think that's the way it often goes now there was Something else I was going to say. So talk again for a while and let me think of what else I was going to say. All right. For the skeptics out there, whether they're Christian oh, skeptics or not. go ahead and stop. Okay. I know what I was going to say. <laughs> Sensei Roth just said something really good. He always says What he, what he said good. was that, that he would tell them to pray um, about yeah. this. 
you know, I can't find anywhere in the Bible, maybe somebody can show me, where we're told, where believers in general are told to speak to demons. But but we but we can pray. Yeah. You know, we can pray, we can ask God to intervene. That's what Paul did. Paul asked God to intervene in the situation here. Now, God thought it best not to intervene in that case. But I think that's what you do. I, someone just asked me the other day in Ireland, in Northern Ireland, somebody asked me about some weird dream they have all the time where they, and they said it wasn't a dream. They, they acted like it was real, where where they were seeing their great-grandfather or something and all these kind of things. And I was saying, I was saying, look, the... I don't know what's going on there, but I can tell you this: best thing to do when that happens is pray. You know, right. just pray. You can always pray. I think that's a good way to react in these situations. Yes, talk to God as if He's actually there because He is. Yeah, because the demons are there, the angels are there, and guess what? God's there too. Well, I'm glad you said that because <laughs> I was about to say for all our skeptics out there, yeah. you know, talking about the angels being there, the demons being there, and God being there, yeah. and the devil and all that. Okay, so what do you say to the skeptics, whether they're Christian or not, who are kind of skeptical about this whole topic of discussion? And I'm sorry, there are skeptical Christians about this. They, yeah. they just roll sure. it like the eye roll crowd. Mm-hmm. Okay, the caricature. Is it really like a demon on one shoulder, an hmm. angel on another shoulder, and you in the middle? You're asking this because I just told you the other day that I kind of feel like there's something legitimate about that. Well, I, I, I'm right there with you. I mean, in a sense, it's a caricature, but it, there there might be a bit of truth in it. I don't you know? know that it's always that, that way. way. Like, I don't think that there's an angel and a demon assigned to me 24 hours a day, and they're always right. waging war over my decisions. But something like that could but occur. But I do think that can occur, yes. Yeah. I, that absolutely, scenario. I think that can occur. You know, I, I was in a play. There's a way to start a sentence that you wouldn't expect. I was in a play when I was... Uh, it, it, hey, to make you feel better, I am confident that your performance was better than the Evansville Shakespeare Company that I, I've <laughs> okay. already trashed previously. Okay. Did, you, that, did that make d- the cut? Do you have anything to say to the Evansville Shakespeare Company? I don't know any of you guys. We are not buzz marketing for the Evansville Shakespeare Company. They because they're not, not any good. They do not underwrite this program. Uh, you could. <laughs> no, you can't. We are well, not endorsing them. I am a big fan of live theater. I would love to watch a bracket. Braxton Hunter no, performance. No, uh, no, not for the right reasons. And I trust you, trust me, it, it was funny. better than the Shakespeare play that they put on the part. Well, they totally my, crashed. My, my then youth pastor, yeah. I was 17 years old, my then youth pastor named J.D. Davis, who now mm-hmm. pastors a church in Ohio, he wrote a play um, called Lucifer's Lies. You mean he didn't buy one from Lifeway? We won't, we won't, we won't quibble over the use of the word Lucifer for Satan there. But right. Lucifer's Lies and... Um, if you want more on the word Lucifer, go listen to my verse by verse uh, and listen on Genesis chapter 3, I think. Go into a whole big thing about Lucifer and uh, the origins of Satan and all that. Hey, I'll, I'll let that slide because he wrote a play instead of bought a play. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. But, and Satan's lies doesn't ring like Lucifer's lies. You know? right. That alliteration is key. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, so anyway, I was this character in the play where I was like a drug addict or something. And um, I had long hair at the time, believe it or not, which worked well because all drug addicts have long hair, as we all know. And um, <laughs> I and and what the, but the whole point of the play was these demonic forces would whisper into the ears of the players. You know, they would whisper in, and the person was obviously not aware that there was a demonic force there. Right. But that was the beauty of it. And then the Holy Spirit was there too. You know, and 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 he would whisper into the ear. I, you know, I, I don't know. We, I can't be dogmatic about how that works, but yeah, it you certainly had, seems you had consistent. You this whispering in your ear. Hmm? Yeah, I had both of them. Right. As, I ended up going to hell, though, in the play. <laughs> as you should. Yeah. But, as, because right. all drug All drug addicts, addicts <laughs> have long hair and go to hell. Right. That's, that's the story. Yeah. No, that's but not, that's not. See, I'm worried that someone who doesn't speak English is going to watch this video and only see the subtitles and not understand the inflection in our voice and think they're teaching that. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't want anybody. Yeah. No, well, actually, is you have to be a good actor to not react to somebody who's technically not there in, in the storyline who's performing around you. I appreciate your repeated attempts to make it sound like I'm a good actor, which you have absolutely no evidence to think. But I'm, I'm confident I was not. But it does, it's, it's irrelevant, right? The, the, I'm trying to help you out, I man. appreciate it. I do, to, I do. That's much appreciated. Yeah. But I was very good, I've been told, in this play that oh, we did had. Oh, did you do a play? I, I, I was in a play, and it was one of those plays 
um, where I was like a British uh, gadget maker or whatever. Um, Did you speak in the play? Yes, I had to use Let's hear your British, British accent. No, it, it's terrible. Come on. You're on the spot now. you <laughs> no. got to do... Uh, but what, what was the... But they said I did a good British accent. I'll do my Irish accent. Oh, that's not good. I, won't do I can't my do British it on, on the spot. It's no good, and they're going to laugh at me. So anyway. You started to do it. You <laughs> I know. started to do so it. Anyway, that's what, I know. That's all you get. But no, it was. I did a play, but it wasn't really about spiritual warfare. It was about the big blue Bible guy. I. Um, who is, what's, um, Saltus, Salty. Salty. Yeah, I haven't thought about salty in years. Right, and he, the pastor played salty, so that that was my dramatic experience. Yeah. I, I had a two bit part in a play with the, I mean, with the blue, big blue Bible that yeah. walked around. Yeah. Anyways, I prefer salty to Veggie Tales. No oh, doubt. I do not prefer salty to Veggie Tales. <laughs> well, it's a matter of taste, right? <laughs> but uh, it is. It's it's subjective. But anyway, salty is better. All right. Uh, Salty is a Bible. The other thing is a tomato and a cucumber. (laughs) I have the Bible vegetables. I was just talking to the pastor, (laughs) Michael Fleming, in Northern Ireland about Veggie Tales. He was talking about how he liked Veggie Tales, but he said, but he said, um, he said, now Bob never. I don't think Bob ever told anyone they were going to hell. He's like, he's probably a liberal. I thought that was funny. I that was funny. But anyway, Let me um, tell you about VeggieTales. The only thing good about VeggieTales is you, you can carry a theme song introducing it with a tuba. That's awesome. Everything we kind else is of, we, Jonathan Pritchett and I kind of enjoy a um, not, not specifically Christian uh, video podcast called Good Mythical Morning. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're not underwriters of this show. I mean, maybe. <laughs> They're so big, but, I don't know the way you get you, but you could be a guy. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but the two guys that are on that show have, I think, did some songs for Veggie Tales. I don't know if you knew that. I didn't. Okay. But anyway, what are we talking about? Ah, oh, spiritual no, they, warfare. They, but bring back Salty. The, the salty. He, could, he could have a comeback. I mean, we're living in the day and age of reboots, you know? Right. Uh, but let's not ever bring back Bible Man. Willie Bible Ames? Man still are you kidding around? me? Willie Ames from... Um, Zapped and, and Charles and Charles in charge. Yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, all right. So spiritual warfare. Uh, uh, last thing I want to say about this you is you know what Bible Man was no worse production wise than those Power Rangers shows. So let's not be t- fair enough. But just Bible and again, Man, really? He, he read like the Bible. that on the nose. Bible. I mean, even Salty was. You kind of have to know that's a that's a, you know an indirect r- or reference to. Uh, we're supposed to be the salt of the earth and all that kind of thing. Well, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering now. Now I'm having doubt, and somebody's going to call me out on this because my my reference is going to. I yeah. can't remember if you, it was the Bible or the songbook or a salt songbook. Now I'm having doubts. Well, that's okay. He was right. And was it salty like the like? It was P S A L T Y. Like the salter. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so now I don't even Okay, think well, who cares anymore? This is not what this show is about. This is demons trying to distract us. Oh, it is now. This is spiritual <laughs> warfare. And there you go. There's he a, can use pop a, ancient Christian... There's a salty demon out there. <laughs> right, yes, but, pop uh, culture to, but, to distract us from the real point. Anyway. Yeah. Arcane, <laughs> then, then, let, let me say something, though, because Bible this stuff. actually does segue back into the thing. People so often speak as though... The things that are that have to do with demonic activity or are going to affect you are the things that are most obvious. Yeah. When in fact, I think it's sometimes much more subtle, like the serpent. You know, like for example, um, I was always raised to believe, you know, if you if you watch horror movies that have that reference witches and demons and stuff, well. You're you're gonna give a foothold to Satan. Did you ever hear that? You're gonna give a foothold to Satan. Yeah, you know, Metallica sort of, was gonna give you a Metallica foothold. Metallica's gonna give you a, give a foothold to Satan. And, and here's the thing about it: I, I do think that we should think on what's good and lovely and pure and all that sort of thing. You know, mm-hmm. we should we should we should not uh, take pleasure in the demonic. And I do think there's a danger in people getting too obsessed because it is fascinating with demonic stuff. And studying it too and the much. the occult in general. And um, we, we have a person who works on staff here that read a book by Malachi Martin, who was a Jesuit um, priest who I think got kicked out because of he went off the rails and went rogue as an exorcist. And he's got a book telling all about this thing. And it's uh, and he read this book um, and um, it, it it affected him. He had to he had to not ever read it anymore because it was messing with his head. 
So I do think there's a negative obsession. However, I think actually what often happens is to, is we ignore the subtle things. For instance, that passage about the foothold, giving foothold to the devil, uh, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 25, it says, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Um, it seems like in context, and I was never, I never knew this growing up. It seems like in context, giving the devil a foothold, what is that most closely related to in the Bible in context? Anger issues. <laughs> You're angry and you don't do anything and how about you it. Act you don't others. respond, yeah. you don't resolve the anger. Yeah. And that is what gives you a foothold to the devil. Or also in context, being truthful and honest and right. a man of integrity. These much more subtle things. And I'll tell you what, there are a lot of husbands and wives who probably have a lot of demonic activity going on in their relationship and they end up getting divorces when, yeah, they never watched Harry Potter because it might <laughs> give a foothold to the devil, but they sure went days and days on end with anger issues unresolved between them. Right. That makes a lot Bam. of sense. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, that's uh, why that's why it's good to do sound exegesis. Yeah. It's like the people who taste not, touch not, want not, you know, they're, yeah. they're quoting a Colossae heresy, and they think that that's a right. biblical principle. Right. 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 And so, yeah. yeah. But it's in the Bible. Yeah, you need yeah. to read it in context. Right. So, right. so <laughs> but anyway, um, all right. If you want more about spiritual warfare, pick up the book by Harold F. Hunter, Spiritual Warfare. Uh, is that the full title? What's the full title? Simple, Simple strategies. strategies for spiritual You don't know warfare. your dad's own book. Much huh? more practical. Um, we'll let that one go. And uh, <laughs> I've read the book, okay? Uh, but Simple Strategies for Spiritual Warfare, uh, you can get it on Amazon. Also, um, we would, we would do we have a class on spiritual warfare? Absolutely. You were mentioning it earlier. Okay. Steve, so, Dr. Steve Selby has an excellent class. On spiritual ex Warfare Selby. That's what we always call him around here. No, and we you, never call him. <laughs> you, can, you can come take classes at Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary by visiting us at Trinity S-E-M, Trinity S-E-M dot E-D-U. And uh, you can learn formally there and you can audit classes. And you can also uh, learn casually uh, by visiting us at BraxtonHunter.com um, or uh, YouTube.com slash Braxton Hunter or wherever you got this. Just keep showing up for more of it. Also, it'd be really nice if you would comment. Um, it would be nice if you would go to the iTunes page and share and share with all of your uh, friends and give us a good review. We'd really appreciate that. See you next time on Trinity Radio.